Good evening. I'm Lana Ulrich, in-house counsel for the National Constitution Center, and welcome to our first America's Town Hall program of the fall 2018 season. Yeah. Um, from Doris Kearns Goodwin to Ken Starr to Richard Brookheiser, it's really going to be a blockbuster this fall, so uh, we are really looking forward to it. Um, before I introduce um, my guest for tonight's program, I'd like to take just a quick moment to let you know about a newly added event to our fall lineup. On Friday, September 21st, the former president of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, will be here at the center for an intimate conversation on democracy and constitutionalism in the United States and Mexico. Um, tickets for this program are free and reservations can be made at constitutioncenter.org forward slash debate or by calling our box office during museum hours. Uh, and next Saturday, September 15th, we will also host Constitution 101, which is exclusive for members, and um, it will give you all the basics as well as some entertaining facts about our nation's founding document. Tickets are free for members and their guests. It can be found at constitutioncenter.org slash members corner. If you're not already a member but are interested in becoming one, you can visit the membership table outside in the lobby for more information on how to join. Okay, and now to introduce my guest this evening. Um, Justin Driver is the Harry N. Wyatt Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School and an editor of the Supreme Court Review. A graduate of Brown, Oxford, and Harvard Law School, he clerked for Supreme Court Justices Stephen Breyer and Sandra Day O'Connor, and also for Judge Merrick Garland. He has published many articles in leading law reviews and has written extensively for publications like Slate, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and The New Republic, where he was a contributing editor. Before attending law school, he received a master's degree in education from Duke and taught civics and American history to high school students. He joins us today to discuss his new book, The Schoolhouse Gate, Public Education, the Supreme Court, and the Battle for the American Mind. Please join me in welcoming Justin Driver. Well, let, me just, let me just say I'm delighted to be with you all today. Uh, I was filled with a sense of trepidation when I was in the airport and I saw nothing but Philadelphia Eagles uh, jerseys. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, have I really done this where it's the opening game of the season? This is, this is the airport in Chicago, by the way. There were nothing but Philadelphia Eagles jerseys. Um, and so I'm so grateful that you all are here and it's a testament to what a wonderful venue this is for discussing constitutional law. When I was writing this book, I sort of thought about the various places that I'd want to be, and so I'm just delighted to be here with you, and so thank you for, for being here on game night of all nights. Thanks, Justin. Well, welcome, and um, everyone's T-bowing it, so. <laughs> yeah, sure enough. Um, okay, so before we get into the history of the Supreme Court decisions that you so um, excellently outline in your book, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself um, introduce your interest in the topic um, and uh, how it led you to studying the topic and to wanting to write this book. Yeah, sure. So this book took me either four years to write or three decades to write, depending upon how you look at it. My interest in schools and the law dates back to my growing up in Washington, D.C., just down the road here. Um, I grew up in southeast Washington, east of the Anacostia River, and uh, my parents made the determination relatively early on that I would not be able to achieve my maximum potential if I went to the local schools. And so starting from a very young age, I traveled all the way from far southeast D.C. to way upper northwest Washington. Uh, and I did that by catching a bus to a couple of different subway lines and then having a very long walk uphill, uh, only one way. Uh, and um, on that long journey, I was thinking, uh, you know, why am I doing this? And, uh, you know, what are the opportunities that I am uh, gaining uh, that my neighbors are not gaining as a result of this? And so I grew up. I was born in 1975. I can remember think, learning about Brown versus Board of Education from a very young age. 
and uh, thinking that our schools in the nation's capital uh, remain uh, all too racially segregated. Uh, you know, so Brown uh, was just uh, very much an abstraction for many schools within shouting distance of the Supreme Court. Um, it's also true that uh, my interest in this area uh, accelerated when I was in junior high school. Uh, I went on an overnight uh, field trip and uh, made a terrible mistake of drinking on an overnight uh, field trip. And I was suspended uh, for this. And uh, I was unaware of the Supreme Court decision called Goss versus Lopez, which affords some due process rights to suspended students. But it seemed very clear to me then uh, that uh, my being suspended was anything but a welcome holiday. So one of the, the dissenting justices in Goss versus Lopez say, yeah, students don't really care about getting suspended. It's no big deal. That was far from my experience. I felt a real sense of sort of shame and embarrassment as a result of this. I thank my lucky stars that this happened uh, in, uh, when it did rather than 10 years later after the rise of zero tolerance policies because Rather than being suspended for three days, I would have been expelled for the remainder of the school year. And I am quite confident in predicting that I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today if uh, you know, I would have been expelled for the remainder of the school year. So these, uh, these, these, these have been, uh, this has been an interest of mine for a long period of time. I thought I was going to be a public school teacher. As you mentioned, I got certified to teach public school at Duke and then uh, you know, uh, sort of diverted for a while, but I think of this book as bringing me back home to a core uh, interest in the field of education. Great. And um, so what's the main argument of the book? What's your core um, um, argument that you're making? Yeah, so I'm trying to examine the intersection of two vital institutions in American society, the public school and the Supreme Court. And I try to contend that you can't understand one institution without understanding how it informs the other. So with respect to public schools, there's a whole array of constitutional law that has been built up over time uh, that informs what happens in public schools. Students have free speech rights, they have minimal due process rights, uh, they have rights regarding search and seizure, um, there are a whole host of uh, constitutional rights involving religion as well. And so I wanted to try to canvas this, canvas this area and explain to educators and parents and students uh, how law informs public schools. And then I also wanted to look at how the Supreme Court's education jurisprudence uh, shapes, uh, or, or I should say illustrates what the Supreme Court can do. Uh, the Supreme Court has, in my view, a much greater capacity for issuing counter-majoritarian opinions than uh, many of my fellow law professors uh, believe. And so I wanted to try to illustrate what the Supreme Court was capable of doing, resisting uh, majorities and shaping our country, often for the better, uh, but in recent decades, I feel like the Supreme Court has fallen down in its responsibility for vindicating constitutional rights. Mm. Let's start um, toward the beginning and talk about some of the early cases and, and maybe where the court got things right, and then we can head into some of the more modern cases and see how it they uh, evolved over time. Um, so some of the first instances in the book, sorry, some of the first cases in the book where the court um, struck down laws that affected um, uh, education was under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. But these cases really weren't about the rights of students. They were more about the rights of parents and teachers. And in particular, uh, the case like Meyer v. Nebraska, uh, where a teacher was teaching in German and he was fined for violating a Nebraska law that said he could only teach in English. Um, can you talk about these cases and why the court was looking only at par parental or teacher rights and not students' rights? Sure. Yeah, so uh, the court decides uh, both Meyer and Pierce versus Society of Sisters in the 1920s through the Due Process Clause. Uh, and it invalidates, in the case of Meyer, English-only uh, teaching requirements. And Pierce versus Society of Sisters involved in Oregon law that sought to prohibit uh, the existence of private schools. This was a measure that was backed by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the fear at the time was that there were these Catholic schools out there and that they were preventing Catholics from being assimilated into the American experience. And so the court, in an opinion by the much reviled Justice McReynolds, uh, 
uh, invalidates both of these measures, and it does so in part for thinking about uh, you know, due process, and this is part of the, the widely uh, disparaged Lochner era, and there is some language in the opinions where they're looking at private schools and they're interfering with the ability of uh, these private ventures to make a go of it. But there is also uh, some language in these opinions that uh, at least paves the way for the rise of students' rights. I think in particular about in uh, Pierce versus Society of Sisters, where McReynolds says uh, that the child is not the mere creature of the state, right? that the state cannot do with the child whatever it wishes. And so you can see some echoes from that Pierce versus Society of Sisters opinion to some of the free speech opinions and others that come along. Mm -hmm. Right, so in um, West Virginia v. Barnett, um, and actually an earlier case which you um, discussed, Hokushije, I think it is, that's when the court really starts, as you say, um, where the court it marked the first significant decision where the court declared the Constitution protects students within the corridors of the nation's public schools. And so can you tell us about Barnett and, and what really prompted this shift to focusing on the rights of students in the schools? Yeah, so Barnett is an opinion from uh, 1943, obviously right in the midst of World War II. The issue there was a desire to require Jehovah's Witnesses students uh, to salute the American flag. They were uh, required to salute or they would be uh, thrown out of school. Uh, they claimed that it interfered with their religious beliefs, that this was uh, you know, uh, a violation of their religious views. In 1940, in a case called Gobitis, the Supreme Court upheld these measures, an opinion by Justice Frankfurter. He says uh, that it's understandable that we have these uh, provisions, that national unity is an important ideal, and then he also says that to interfere in this realm would be to turn the Supreme Court into a school board for the nation. This is supposed to be a uh, sort of a, a harrowing idea. Three short years later in the Barnett decision, Justice Jackson writes this incredibly important opinion where he reconceives of the right at issue not as being about the freedom of religion, but instead about the freedom of speech. He says that the freedom, of, uh, the freedom to speak also involves a corollary right of the freedom not to speak. And so this is what constitutional law professors refer to as the compelled speech doctrine. And uh, there's no doubt that these measures enjoyed great popularity. This is, again, during World War II. At the time of the Gobitis decision in 1940, schools in 15 different states were expelling Jehovah's Witness students for not saluting the American flag. Three years later, uh, schools in all 48 states were issuing or expelling these students for refusing to salute the American flag. So this is a testament to the Supreme Court's ability to vindicate constitutional rights in public schools. And this compelled speech doctrine is one that has been uh, sort of exported from the public schools to be a constitutional doctrine uh, the, the, that exists outside of the schoolhouse gate. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that it, they overturned it in, in so, you know, only a couple of years later. And in your book, you, you have a a very interesting story about um, Justice Frankfurter at a party and everyone's freaking out about Gobitis and there was a, a huge outcry from the nation about that. I mean, that's very striking that the court just kind of turned around and corrected itself very quickly. Yeah, it's a very rare thing for the Supreme Court to turn around. This is one area where elite opinion seems to have diverged from the views of uh, ordinary people. That is to say that in the newspapers and in the law reviews, people thought that Gobitis was an abomination. And exactly as you suggest, I opened the book with the wedding of Catherine Meyer, who would become Catherine Graham, to Philip Graham, uh, where uh, on their wedding day at this beautiful estate in upstate New York, a vicious fight breaks out two days after the Gobitis decision, which Frankfurter wrote. And they say, you know, Felix, you're dead wrong. And Frankfurter apparently loved an argument. He really enjoyed mixing it up with people. But this went too far. Uh, you know, tempers really flared. Uh, the best man at the wedding has these tears that are streaming down his face. Uh, 
Uh, and eventually, Justice Frankfurter gets up and says, come along, Kay, we have to calm down before the wedding. Uh, and uh, the wedding did happen, but I open there because I think it's a testament to the way that these sorts of opinions get people riled up. Uh, people feel very passionately about uh, public schools and constitutional rights, and this is a point that Justice Jackson makes in the Barnett opinion, where he says that it's particularly important for us to honor constitutional rights in the nation's public schools, lest we uh, teach students to discount constitutional rights as mere platitudes. We risk strangling the free mind at its source, he says. So that's a really important opinion for me. Mm -hmm. um, well, another significant opinion, we can't uh, not discuss uh, free speech in schools without discussing Tinker, uh, which was in the 1960s, obviously another very heated time in the nation during the context of the Vietnam War. Uh, and in that case, uh, the opinion by Justice Fortas said that students have affirmative speech rights under the First Amendment in school. Um, but Justice Black wrote a very vehement dissent. And, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about why Black was so against the idea of students having these free speech rights in schools? Yeah, so Justice Black issues a uh, really remarkable dissent. He read his dissent from the bench uh, in indication of very strong disagreement. He says, I want it known that I disavow any word, you know, any sentence, any part of what the Supreme Court is doing today. Uh, this is a case that's decided in 1969, uh, but it's worth noting that the protest itself in Des Moines Public Schools occurred in 1965, December of 1965. This is long before protests against the Vietnam War were popular, and so school administrators get wind of this and say, no, 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 you cannot wear these black armbands. We had a student who died over in Vietnam. He has classmates who are still here. This is too contentious an issue. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, the Supreme Court issued an opinion by Fortas uh, that vindicates those rights and says that it can hardly be argued that students shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. This is what supplies the title for the book. Uh, Black's dissent, uh, you know, was uh, driven by the idea that he thought students are there to learn and not to teach, uh, that they are uh, there to, in effect, be seen and not heard. And, uh, you know, some people have suggested that Black, who was a, a real defender of free speech in many areas, was driven by a personal situation. Uh, he had a grandson who was uh, suspended from public school for producing some sort of underground newspaper. And some people have said that it's those personal events that led him to act out in this way and write this really sort of nasty dissent, that he was overtaken uh, by a sort of, I don't know, grandfatherly uh, moment of peak. I, I think that is uh, an inaccurate way to view what Justice Black was up to there. It seems worth noting that in some of the uh, direct action uh, protests of the civil rights movement that Black was not receptive to freedom of speech arguments, and we can see this as part of a larger concern in the 1960s that American society is spiraling out of control. I actually think that Black's view was more popular among the public than the majority view. There was some polling data that I found uh, that suggested that students should not be able to carry out their rights. And the polling data is actually phrased in a way that would have most readily conjured for most people uh, the protests that were happening at Columbia University and many other universities around the country. And so people would have feared if that's happening at the college level, my goodness, mayhem is really going to descend at the high school level. But I admire the Fortis opinion so much because he says that it, it goes much further than Barnett. Barnett says uh, there's a right not to speak, but Tinker protects, at least in certain instances, the ability of students to communicate with one another. And I think that the genius of Fortis's opinion is he says that uh, you know, uh, students speaking to one another is an important part of the educational process itself. We have a uh, relatively permissive uh, in an often disputatious society, and that it would be antithetical, and he almost says un-American, to try to shut that down in the schoolhouse itself. So I think it's a really uh, terrific uh, 
opinion. In my view, in recent decades, the court hasn't done a sufficiently good job at building on the foundation of Tinker, but I think that Tinker was a real breakthrough. Mm. So is Tinker still, it's the governing standard still that, that, that um, you know, schools have to use? It's this dis idea of a disturbance that students can't cause a disturbance in school, but who decides that really? It's a good question. Tinker is the default standard. Uh, the test as articulated by the Supreme Court is uh, whether educators have a reasonable fear of substantial disruption that will flow from the speech and then it's permissible to silence the speech. I think that Tinker in some respects did not go far enough. The opinion can be understood to read into uh, this doctrine, uh, something called the heckler's veto. This is the idea where particularly sensitive speakers, or pardon me, particularly sensitive listeners can, if they get very upset, uh, uh, you know, become angry and threaten violence and uh, prevent someone from being able to express legitimate views. Uh, but that reasonable fear of substantial disruption test does seem to almost read into Tinker this heckler's veto idea. So I wish that school administrators would do a better job of uh, protecting speakers and if someone's threatening violence, then uh, the person who's threatening violence, uh, it seems to me, often should be brought in uh, you know, uh, to, for a talking to, at a minimum. Um, in recent years, the court has eroded or carved out a number of exceptions to Tinker, including in the case involving Matthew Frazier from the 1980s dealing with uh, sexual innuendo during a uh, high school speech uh, nominating his buddy for vice president and uh, in a case that was decided when I was a law clerk at the Supreme Court uh, called Morse versus Frederick at the Supreme Court that term no one ever referred to it, referred to the case as Morse versus Frederick this is 2007 everyone referred to it as bong hits for Jesus <laughs> Uh, this is attributable to a sign that a high school senior in Juneau, Alaska had uh, outside of a parade uh, that's making its way through his hometown. He unfurls a 14-foot long banner that reads, Bong Hits for Jesus. And there, uh, the court carves out another exception to Tinker, um, where it says, if the principal reasonably believes that the speech in question is promoting illicit drug use, then it's permissible to suppress that speech. You know, that's a really unusual move in the First Amendment because the First Amendment, generally speaking, uh, is about viewpoint neutrality. But there, we have an express, uh, you know, sort of viewpoint restriction. Uh, Anti-drug speech is fine, but pro-drug speech is impermissible. And perhaps not surprisingly, lower courts have expanded uh, that rationale to apply not just to the drug context. Mm -hmm. um, and what about student speech online? You know, let's say a student's using Facebook or Twitter or in some way that violates some kind of school policy. I mean, how, how do schools deal with that today? Is there, a, is there a governing standard? Is it, you know, under Tinker or Morse? Or, you know, how are courts grappling with these issues? It's a good question. The Supreme Court of the United States has yet to weigh in on sort of speech that takes place online. Um, and it's a very tricky area, and I do think that the lower courts need guidance uh, from the Supreme Court, uh, because the temptation is to say, well, if there's something that's uttered offline that leads to uh, some sort of commotion within the school, then that's going to be impermissible. But a, you know, at least one potential problem with that standard would be that that would expand the schoolhouse gate so as to be everywhere. A great deal of communication uh, happens online from uh, teenagers these days. Uh, you know, students are often uh, engaging one another and uh, there are some troubling lower court decisions. There's a case out of the Second Circuit where a student uh, body uh, representative was very upset because uh, the principals uh, were putting her off on her planned jam fest, right? They wanted to have a battle of the bands at the school. And they kept putting her off and putting her off. And so eventually she writes this post that encourages uh, her 
classmates and their parents to contact what she referred to as the douchebags <laughs> in, in the central office and let them know that we want to have this battle of the bands and everything. And so, you know, I think that there may be a generational component there uh, <laughs> and that the term that she used has been severed from any sort of literal uh, connection. And, uh, you know, distressingly from my perspective, the Second Circuit upheld the punishment uh, of this student. She was uh, the student body, I believe it was either, you know, treasurer or vice president, something like that. She was prohibited from being able to run for student body uh, representation again for the student body uh, government. And the court sort of says, well, she wasn't suspended, and, uh, but you know, she used her voice in order to encourage people to contact the office and have the battle of the bands at the time. I don't believe in the fundamental right to rock on, but I do believe in the ability of student body uh, government officials to say, hey, let's contact the principals and try to uh, change the policy. So uh, there was another wrinkle in that case where uh, students wore t-shirts to school that said support freedom of speech at LMHS, which stood for the high school. And the principal was there outside of the uh, meeting that where the student body nominating speeches were to be delivered and was telling students they couldn't wear these t-shirts in, the, uh, in, the, in the event itself. So I think that the Supreme Court has been too lax in this area. Uh, and there is a certain supposition that we are judges, you know, we are not teachers, we don't have any area, any expertise in this area, and we should back off. But I think that's wrong-headed. When you step back to think about the many areas that the Supreme Court is responsible for issuing governing constitutional provisions, they know a lot more about what happens in schools than they do know about what happens uh, for police officers who are out on the beat or pulling over someone on a, uh, for a traffic stop. And so uh, when you step back and really scrutinize that, I don't think that should hold much water. Mm, interesting. Um, well, there's lot, definitely a lot more areas to talk about uh, where the Supreme Court, Court has ruled. Um, and, but before going into a discussion on the Fourth Amendment, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Eighth Amendment. And one thing that I was um, surprised and, and shocked to learn from your book is that um, the court has not ruled that corporal punishment of students violates the Eighth Amendment, at least minor corporal punishment. And so, and, and not many, there are many states that have outlawed it, but some states that have not, and this is still going on today. So um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, any of the cases the court may have heard on this issue and, you know, wh where it's at today? Sure, yeah. So this is the issue that I care the single uh, most passionately uh, about, the existence of corporal punishment, which still exists in this great nation of ours. Uh, uh, you know, the court had an opportunity to rein in this practice in 1977 in a case called Ingram versus Wright, which raised the question of whether there would be due process rights before someone was uh, to be hit with a wooden, a wooden paddle. Um, this case comes only two years after Goss versus Lopez, which afforded due process rights to students prior to suspension. They have a right to an informal hearing. And many people thought it would be inconceivable uh, to have due process rights before suspension, but not before being physically uh, hit. Uh, both decisions are five to four, but in the Ingram versus Wright decision, the Supreme Court says, no, there are no due process rights. Uh, if there's a truly terrible infraction, then they may be able to seek recourse in the state courts. Um, the facts of Ingram are truly astonishing. Um, this is a school in Miami, uh, in Dade County, uh, an all-black school. James Ingram uh, was on, a, uh, on uh, 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 an auditorium on the stage, not unlike this one that we're on now. And he's told to get off the stage, and he commits the terrible, the heinous infraction of being a bit tardy uh, departing the stage. And for this, he's ushered into the principal's office. He's promised to receive five licks in the parlance, and he says, in effect, like, I didn't do it, or something like that. 
whereupon some assistant principals bent him over the desk, uh, and he receives 20 uh, hits with this big wooden paddle. Uh, it was so intense that he sought and received medical attention. Um, he's uh, bleeding uh, and receives a whole battery of cold compresses and laxatives and misses two weeks of school and it's another week before uh, he can sit comfortably. And so if you're a lawyer and you're bringing uh, this case, you think of these as the most sympathetic facts as possible. The school district itself was truly uh, astonishing. There were some principals from neighboring schools who gave really sort of damning testimony as well. Uh, there was a school in, um, I'm not bringing up the, uh, the exact area, uh, but it's a school, this principal says, my students, uh, it's a heavily Jewish population here. They are accustomed to verbal persuasion, right? There is oral persuasion, this is the culture. And of course the implication is that the students at Charles Drew Junior High School understand only physical force. Um, so uh, the, I think the case was, the decision was mis misguided in 1977, however, there were only two states that abolished corporal punishment at that time. There are now more than 30 states have abolished corporal punishment. And even though something like 19 states have retained the practice, that actually overstates uh, how widespread uh, it is in the sense that only a handful of states, only a handful of states uh, account for something like 70% of corporal punishment that exists, and this is all in the Deep South. And so it's uh, my single ho greatest hope for the book is that it will raise consciousness about this issue. I think that many people are unaware that corporal punishment uh, continues to exist, and so I'm hopeful that this book will uh, grab the attention of the federal judiciary uh, in addressing this issue. I say the federal judiciary, mind you, uh, because I don't think that the jurisdictions that retain the practice are going to abandon it on their own. Uh, it's a practice that's found uh, in just a small number of states, and even uh, it's not found all throughout the states. In the urban areas, it doesn't exist. It's often in the rural areas. And so uh, I, I hope that this, uh, when you're thinking about cruel and unusual punishment, uh, it happens something like 20,000 times over the course of the year, but that, in my view, is 20,000 times too many. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, I think my main surprise was, you know, hearing stories about students uh, in corporal punishment from the 60s and 70s. Typically, uh, I, you know, I've heard from a parochial school or a religious school, but not a public school, and so realizing that that is actually still the case, I, th I found very surprising. Yeah, just one more thing on that to underscore how unusual it is. Uh, even by the time of the Ingram versus Wright decision in, in 1977, corporal punishment had been uh, ab abolished in prisons. Uh, the Eighth Circuit, in an opinion by then Judge Blackman, got rid of what was called the strap, right? That you could just beat, uh, beat prisoners in order to uh, teach them some lessons. And so again, many people thought, if you can't hit someone who's been convicted of a crime and is in prison, how can you hit students who have been convicted of nothing whatsoever. Uh, and so Judge Blackman, when he became Justice Blackman, joined the majority in Ingram versus Wright and did not endeavor uh, to explain why it was impermissible to hit uh, prisoners, uh, inmates in prison, but it was permissible to hit students. The Supreme Court opinion uh, says the Eighth Amendment, the Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause, extends only from uh, criminal convictions. And so even if the hitting isn't part of the criminal uh, conviction itself, that there was a criminal conviction in the past. Uh, but it seems to me that that reads the word uh, cruel and unusual punishment stemming from a criminal conviction. And so I hope that for those who pride themselves on taking constitutional text seriously, uh, that people will revisit that and say, of course this is punishment. How can we not view corporal punishment in public schools as punishment. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about another area where it seems the criminal law, uh, criminal constitutional law overlaps with public schools, and that's the Fourth Amendment. 
Uh, and the case New Jersey via TLO where a student was searched, uh, who challenged that search, uh, the court basically held that, you know, the typical probable cause standard, which is, you know, if a, a police officer was searching a citizen, that would apply. That doesn't apply in schools. It's a lower standard, a reasonable suspicion standard. Um, what, what, what was the court's rationale for finding that a lower standard is more appropriate in a school setting versus the probable cause standard? Yeah, there are a few different rationales in TLO. Uh, one would be the nature of the schoolhouse and there being real concerns about safety. Uh, a second rationale for reasonable suspicion rather than probable cause uh, would be that these are teachers uh, in 1985 who are doing the overwhelming uh, majority of the searches and so they shouldn't have to familiarize themselves with the intricacies of probable cause. Uh, teachers are not police officers. You know, it was a relatively rare thing in 1985 for police officers to be in schools. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, and so with the rise of what people refer to as school resource officers, that's an Orwellian name if ever there were one, right? School resource officers, uniformed police officers who are assigned to public schools, it seems to me that some of TLO's rationale about lowering the threshold uh, might be diminished. When I think about the Fourth Amendment, um, the cases that bother me the most in this area um, are those involving suspicionless drug searches, where the court in a couple of different cases has said initially it's permissible to require varsity athletes to uh, submit to suspicionless drug testing uh, because in this particular school, the, the, the student athletes were the leaders of the school, they were the cool kids, right? They sort of set the tone and, uh, and athletics were very important in this area and there was a real notion that there was a drug problem. Uh, a few years later, uh, the court extended the rationale to apply not just to athletics, even though that was very much the rationale of that first opinion. In the Earl's case, they extended it to all extracurricular activities uh, and said, if you're in the debate club, you can, uh, schools can require you to submit to uh, suspicionless drug testing, whereby educators come and take students en masse in order to uh, you know, have them urinate in uh, vials. And uh, Lindsey Earls talks about a student in Oklahoma, you know, going to the restroom, having somebody stationed outside listening for the telltale signs of urination, coming out, handing it to the teacher, the teacher holds it up to the light in order to inspect it. And so my, one of the hopes for the book is that we may be able to find some common ground in this polarized age between liberals and the libertarian inflected vision that is ascendant in some right-leaning circles. Libertarians are serious about having skepticism about state authority. It seems to me that having people uh, you know, take these drug tests more or less for uh, simply going to a public school uh, should be cause for alarm. And that's one area where maybe we'll be able to get some traction. Mm -hmm. And have you know, the recent, uh, maybe not recent, but, but in, in the past couple decades, the incidents of school shootings, Columbine, Newtown, Parkland, has that, you know, caused any courts to pause and think a little bit more about giving administrators more latitude in terms of what kinds of policies they can put into place, how, you know, what kind of level of, of uh, suspicion they need to search a student in terms of a, safety in that sense? I mean, has, oh. it, has anything changed? Yeah. Uh, you, one does find repeatedly when you examine these cases, judges do use the terminology, the post-Columbine age, the post-Columbine era. Uh, obviously, that happened in 1999, and I do think that that marked an important moment. I, for one, uh, am not hostile to uh, metal detectors uh, in, in schools. Uh, some people are. I take school safety very seriously. I do think, uh, nevertheless, uh, 
uh, that uh, there has been, uh, because it, these are so high salience and so upsetting of events, people overestimate the likelihood that this is going to happen at any particular school. Even after the horrible events in Parkland, at any given public school, uh, any given public school can expect a school shooting to occur in its premises about once every 6,000 years. Uh, so uh, these are high salience, deeply upsetting, deserving of our attention. I support uh, reasonable uh, gun regulations, but I don't think that people should believe that this is a likely event to happen at, at their school. Uh, and so uh, we should have some sense of perspective. The other thing to say about this is when you're thinking about the Fourth Amendment and searches and uh, seizures, uh, these events have not happened because uh, teachers have a suspicion that someone has a firearm. Uh, this is, you know, people are coming in with guns blazing, right? And so this is not. Uh, something that I think is likely to be solved by that area. Nevertheless, it surely has had an effect on the jurisprudence in wanting to give great amounts of leeway to educators to be able to serve students. Mm -hmm. And s students, uh, or at least the Supreme Court hasn't ruled that students have any um, like Second Amendment rights in schools yet either. There's no, there's no uh, cases on that? That's yeah. exactly right. In the Heller decision, which is the leading opinion in this area expressly said that there are certain buildings that are safe spaces in effect uh, from uh, firearms, uh, identifies governmental buildings and also schools mm -hmm. as uh, it being, uh, it, it's, it suggests uh, that uh, the Second Amendment have, may have limited applicability within, within the schoolhouse gate. Mm -hmm. Okay, well there are so many good questions, so I wanna try to see how many we can get to. Um, uh, one question asks, uh, does, this, does the current Supreme Court nominee, which is Judge Brett Kavanaugh, have any opinions that would help us to know where he stands on public education and student rights? Uh, and I you know, should mention that he is um, you know, uh, being uh, confirmed to replace Justice Kennedy, who wrote uh, many significant opinions in the area, in particular on the 14th Amendment equal protection in the affirmative action context. So is there anything uh, that you might be able to say about how, um, ju if Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed, how that area of law in particular might change? Yeah, so there are a couple of things that spring to mind. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh did write an opinion in the D.C. Circuit uh, dealing with suspicionless drug testing, not of, uh, not of students, but of teachers. And he believed that that should be permissible. And so it's unlikely, I suspect, that uh, he would uh, be willing to rein in uh, those decisions that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, uh, there's reason to believe, as a result not of his judicial writings, but of some of his statements that he's made uh, as an attorney, uh, that he would take a harder line than currently exists with respect to the ability to have race conscious admissions practices in higher education and also in schools. Uh, when I was a law clerk at the Supreme Court, the uh, court decided a case called Parents Involved in Community Schools. Uh, this was a case, uh, a couple of cases out of Louisville and Seattle where there were voluntary integration programs and uh, the Supreme Court in an opinion uh, by Chief Justice Roberts said that these programs violate the Equal Protection Clause. He claimed the mantle of Brown uh, and said that Brown was about telling students where they can go to school on the basis of their color of their skin. Uh, these programs, even though they're designed to bring people from different racial backgrounds together, also tell people where they can go to school on the basis of the color of their skin. Justice Kennedy, though, wrote an important uh, concurrence uh, that said that it's not incumbent upon school districts to be colorblind when they are devising borders around school districts uh, and they can build schools in particular areas that would foster racial integration. I could imagine given some of his uh, writings, uh, a, a Justice Kavanaugh taking a harder line and saying, 
uh, our Constitution is colorblind with Justice Harlan, and so being even to the right of Justice Kennedy on that issue. Another area uh, where we may see some movement would be with respect to uh, religion in public schools. Uh, uh, pardon me, Kavanaugh, when he was an attorney, did write an amicus brief uh, in a case called Santa Fe versus Doe, dealing with prayer over a public school uh, loudspeaker at a football game in Texas. Uh, where the Supreme Court says that this seems, this violates the Establishment Clause. Uh, Kavanaugh's uh, brief suggested that that outcome was wrong. That was an opinion that was written by Justice Kennedy where he says this has a coercive element. So uh, unbeknownst to many people, uh, religion is a particularly hot topic, uh, historically speaking, but I think that there's been an area of relative tranquility has descended over religion in public schools, but that could become a flashpoint in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Um, one of our audience question cards notes that good news for PA, we have banned corporal punishment in Pennsylvania public schools, so that's great to hear. So thank you for that fact. Um, and uh, a, a similar question, uh, or a question also about Pennsylvania asks about um, equitable funding of schools. Um, and, and a similar question also asks about what the court has had to say about disparate funding for public schools and um, whether you know you think there may be any future cases that might readdress that issue. Yeah, so the Supreme Court of the United States had a case called San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez in 1973, uh, which challenged the method of school financing in Texas. Edgewood was a very poor area in San Antonio. Alamo Heights, as it sounds, was a very wealthy area in San Antonio and the students in Alamo Heights received a lot more money per pupil than the students in Edgewood. Uh, when this case was filed in the 1960s, many people thought it was virtually inevitable that the Supreme Court would invalidate that method of school financing. My predecessor at the University of Chicago, Professor Philip Curlin, said, I should tell you it's only a matter of time before the Warren Court, that egalitarian institution, uh, invalidates the school financing method that exists in Texas and most of the nation. This is not a prospect that he relished, uh, but he thought there's no way that uh, the Supreme Court of the United States is going to uphold this. That's not quite how things turned out, right? In 1973, the Supreme Court turned away these challenges. One coda, though, is that uh, Justice Marshall wrote a magnificent dissent, and in footnote 100 of that dissent, he suggested that uh, litigants should turn away from federal courts and seek relief in state courts. And many of those efforts have been successful, including in Texas. Uh, you know, there are some years where students in Edgewood now receive more money per pupil than uh, students in Alamo Heights. And it's not only Texas. So uh, this is an area where state courts interpreting the state constitutions have led to greater amounts of equity. I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> I think there's a similar case pending in California, too. I think the Vergara case, which is also about, I think, under the state constitution, the fundamental right to education. Um, uh, a related question asks um, about your thoughts on right to access to quality education. And um, you know the Supreme Court hasn't yet declared a federal fundamental constitutional right to education, but has it ever come close and do you think we'll ever get there? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a case right now in uh, Michigan where people in Detroit are in federal court uh, claiming that uh, there is a right to literacy. Um, you know, Rodriguez does not recognize a uh, fundamental right to education, but an important part of the opinion says that these students in Edgewood are not absolutely deprived education, right? Theirs is a relative deprivation. That would become important nine years later after Rodriguez in the Plyler versus Doe decision where Texas passed a law that sought to exclude unauthorized immigrants from public schools altogether. And Justice uh, Powell joined uh, the majority there. Um, he wrote the opinion in Rodriguez. 
and said that it's impermissible to exclude unauthorized immigrants from public school. That's an incredibly important opinion. Some of my fellow constitutional law professors have tried to diminish the importance of that opinion and said, well, it was only Texas that had the law at that time. Therefore, it was an outlier. Just those, those yahoos down in Texas, right, those cowboys, uh, where I lived for five very happy years, I should say. I was a member of the University of Texas Law School faculty. Only they would have passed such a measure. And that, of course, is false. Alabama has passed a law like this. California has passed a law like this. And many other states would have passed laws. Anxieties about unauthorized immigrants are not confined to Texas. Uh, and so this is an instance where the Supreme Court of the United States has invalidated uh, a measure found in one place, but surely it interred that legislation from finding a foothold in other areas. The case out of Michigan um, says that uh, the student outcomes are abysmal. Uh, many students uh, come, where no, come nowhere close to having even basic proficiency in reading. And so they say that the funding levels are inadequate and they are attempting to find some wiggle room uh, out of Rodriguez. They lost in the lower courts and that case is making its way uh, to the circuit court now. So we have to stay tuned. Mm -hmm. okay. um, has the court dealt with dress codes in public schools? Good question. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States has not uh, uh, squarely uh, resolved dress, code, dress codes. Uh, there is some dicta in the Tinker opinion uh, that says, in effect, uh, we're not talking about uh, dress codes here. Um, at the time, in the 1960s, there was a lot of angst about male students with long hair, can you imagine, right? Um, and fearful about how this would become really distracting and everything, right? Um, and so, uh, but the court has never uh, resolved that matter. The New York Times editorial in the, wake, in the wake of Tinker read, armbands, yes, miniskirts, no, right? <laughs> uh, so the lower courts that have in, been involved in this area um, have been very receptive uh, to the existence of dress codes. And I think that the Supreme Court of the United States should get involved in this area and demonstrate greater skepticism of uh, dress codes. There's almost a reflexive belief that dress codes are just fine. You could imagine a strong claim about the freedom of expression. Some of these dress codes, not even school uniforms, mind you, but dress codes prohibit people from wearing t-shirts Obviously, a t-shirt is a really effective way at expressing one's political viewpoints. Um, you could imagine uh, an argument sounding in liberty as well. I mean, it's odd that outside of the military context and the, um, uh, the prison context that the government is telling uh, you know, students what they can put on their bodies. Um, I think that we should be uh, more skeptical. I wouldn't say that they are invariably impermissible. I could imagine if there are schools with, you know, uh, gangs and gang violence and there being issues about people flashing colors and these sorts of things. So I'm not a zealot on this issue, but I think that there should be greater skepticism uh, uh, on the part of lower courts on, toward uh, school uniform policies than currently uh, exists. Mm -hmm. um. Another question asks something that's a little bit similar. Uh, it's more of a hypothetical, but if a, you know, a t-shirt with a, maybe a political slogan like, uh, or from a group like Black Lives Matter or something contemporary um, would cause some kind of disturbance, would that be something that a school could say, you know, try to limit students, um, uh, I guess they, not the viewpoint, but they could say, okay, no shirts with writings on it or something, they could react to that? Yeah, if there is a reasonable fear of a substantial disruption under Tinker, then it may well be permissible to suppress that speech. The way that courts tend to assess reasonable fear of substantial disruption is whether the clothing at issue has led to disturbances in the past. You need not go to anything like Black Lives Matter in order to uh, make the claim. There's a, in my estimation, disturbing case out of the Ninth Circuit 
where the school prohibited students from wearing the American flag to uh, school. Uh, why? Um, it was on uh, the 5th of May, Cinco de Mayo. And some students say, uh, why are you wearing the American flag today? You don't, like, you don't like Mexicans, right? And there's some sort of threat, and it's viewed as this is a provocation. And I, I can, in some sense, understand uh, the sentiments that lead to that feeling of uh, disgruntlement. Nevertheless, the idea that school administrators should be telling people they can't wear the American flag to school strikes me as deeply wrongheaded, but I wouldn't stop with the American flag. I would want uh, students to be able to wear uh, contentious issues. There's a case out of Texas, the great state of Texas, where there were students who were wearing uh, Border Patrol t-shirts and other students uh, that said, we are not criminals. Now, I understand that those issues, uh, those issues are incredibly, they, they inspire a lot of passion, but immigration and immigration policy is a really important question for the United States. The idea that students shouldn't be able to express themselves on that issue through that form seems deeply wrongheaded to me. And indeed, when you think back to the Tinker case in the 1960s, People really did, uh, tempers flared about the, the Vietnam War. The Tinkers had their home splattered with red paint as a result of them wearing these black armbands to school. The implication was that only someone who's a communist uh, would oppose the Vietnam War. And so if you think about the Vietnam War is very important, thoughts about immigration are very important. Uh, and I want the students to be able to express themselves and to have uh, disagreements um, without, uh, without threatening violence on one another. And it seems to me that if people are threatening violence, that it's those folks that should be brought in uh, rather than uh, you know, the person who's wearing the symbol, um, at, least, at least if it doesn't go too far. Um, this question asks about um, free speech and free press in schools, uh, referring to the Hazelwood v. Colmere case. Um, have there been any updates, expansions, or additional restrictions since this case was decided? Okay, yeah, so Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer is a decision involving student newspapers uh, where the principal reads a couple of articles in the spectrum, the student newspaper, before it's going to go out to the students. Uh, one of them involved, one of the articles in question involved um, an article about divorce and its effect on students where there's a parent saying, or pardon me, where there's a student who says, uh, my dad was playing cards and he was never home and so my mom was fed up and the principal said, well, this identifies a student by name and we don't give the father an opportunity to respond, so I'm gonna pull that article. And the second article in question dealt with a number of young women who became pregnant. And while the article anonymized the women, the principal feared that there were uh, you know, enough uh, specifics that it would have revealed their identity. Uh, in my view, the principal behaved abysmally here by pulling these, uh, these articles. It seems to me that talking about teenage pregnancy, many of the students are saying, I didn't think it would happen to me, you know, we only did it once, these sorts of things. What could be more valuable for a high school newspaper than this sort of article? And, you know, it's not a shock who the people are who become pregnant when they have these babies and everything, right? And so the idea that this was a secret that nobody knew struck me as incredibly implausible. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I actually think the Supreme Court got that right. I wouldn't have decided as the court did, I would have decided it under the government speech doctrine. If you view the principal as having control in the form of editor-in-chief, when you import First Amendment principles in that area, I think it gets very complicated. Uh, remember that the principal here is reviewing the articles before they go out. Uh, when you think about that, is that not, if you're thinking about the First Amendment, isn't that a prior restraint? Uh, and so I think that uh, that was actually right, even though I think that principal, if I were the school superintendent, I would bring that person in at a minimum for a stern talking to, and if I could get rid of them, I think that was terrible judgment. There have been some subsequent uh, developments where people pass what is referred to as anti-Hazelwood um, 
legislation where they offer their student journalists greater protection than the Supreme Court uh, pr protected, and this may be uh, as good a place to end as any. I think that um, you know, even if we don't get relief from the Supreme Court, uh, it's important for state legislatures to build upon the constitutional floor that the Supreme Court has articulated. And there's nothing that would prohibit, uh, you know, uh, state legislators, state legislatures, from passing more protective legislation. So that's my hope that this book will encourage people to get involved and think about how our schools should be reformed. Great. Justin Driver, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.